Well, folks, welcome back to the channel. For those of you who have been here before, welcome to the channel. If you've never been here before, I am back with another finished What If Project walk around. Yeah, I don't have the, the build in progress video for this one because it's just been a long time in, in the making. This is based off of Hasegawa's 172 scale X29. And uh, what we've done here is we've decided to play the what if game. What if the US Air Force decided that they wanted to turn the X-29 into an actual fighter aircraft in the mid 1980s when the X-29 started flying. So we have what I guess would be an F-29. You can see it's finished in the markings of the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing. So just having the T in front of the FW would, would time date this prior to 1992 when the Air Force consolidated the tactical and strategic air commands together so we we lost the tactical in the the tactical fighter wing it would just become a fighter wing so we'll talk a little bit about the x-29 and its purpose and why it actually would not make a very good fighter but it sure does look cool and sort of historically if this was true what it would be doing and and the markings and all that stuff and We'll walk around and talk about the build and what it's all made of and, and weapons load and stuff like that and the finishing. So the Hasegawa 172 scale X-29 kit is, I, I think it's really the only decent X-29 kit out there on the market. I'm dying for somebody to do this over again in 148. I think it would make a great addition to the, the library of kits out on the market. It would just be fantastic. But for a 172 scale kit, it's not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. It's got some decent detail engraved panel lines. They're very shallow, but that's scale appropriate. Um, it represents, you know, what the X-29 was, which was a test model, uh, a test aircraft. So it has fittings for a test aircraft, you know, it, you have to really do some kit bashing and scratch work to turn it into a, a combat aircraft, which we did. The X-29 had no radar. It had no sensors or anything like that. The X-29 was, was made to test the viability of the forward swept wing concept for hyper maneuverability and dealing with a concept called aeroelasticity and having to do with the way the air flows and aerodynamic forces of the air proceeding down the wing and over the fuselage and vortices and, and air braking, not braking in terms of air brakes, but how the, it breaks across the fuselage. And um, it involved some composite materials on the wings for stability and, and how the wings would, would warp and flap and everything. And it didn't really result in, in what either the Air Force or NASA wanted. What's kind of interesting is that it was a Grumman project, the X-29, but it was all based off of a Northrop F-5A Freedom Fighter, you know, fuselage, an F-16 landing gear, and then some very specific uh, tweaks that Grumman made, obviously, with the wings and these uh, strakes and the canards and everything, um, but it's... It's funny that it's a Grumman aircraft, all based on on other other companies, you know, work to begin with, and then they they modified it up. I just think that's kind of an interesting historical note on the X twenty nine. And there were two built, and they flew from uh, the late eighties into the nineties, and they they did their test flights, and that was kind of the end of it. But the shape of it, the combination of the forward swept wings and the canards. It's just been such a cool shape. People have loved it ever since. And in reality, the wings were very thin and they were not made structurally to carry any load. So it would have taken a lot of modification of that design to turn it into a combat aircraft capable of carrying any kind of ordnance. It couldn't do what, you, what we're looking at it do right now. It absolutely couldn't, but it sure would be sweet to see it do that. So modifying the kit, to do what to have it look like what it looks like today included first uh, modifying the nose 
to look more like an F-20 type radome sculpt, cutting off the, the large experimental pitot tube with all of its uh, various um, test probes and stuff, and then sanding it down and, and profiling it a little bit so it looked more like, more like an aerodynamically shaped radome than just something where you cut off a, a pitot tube. I have done X-29s before where I left some of that pitot tube coming out. It just, it kind of looks a little large in scale for a pitot tube. There was just, there was just uh, two, two, two uh, UHF aerials for communicating with, you know, the, the test ground crew. One under the nose and one on the, the spine in the dorsal area of the aircraft. Um, but, you know, for, for a combat aircraft, you need more communication options. So these were actually um, the the fins on a up here and up here and I just cut that one to look cool or basically but they were from a um, Mark 84 2000 pound bomb and I just cut them off and glued them on and bam we've got extra radio antennas no problem um, these S210 launch rails came out of uh, I don't remember you know you know what there's a 172 scale F16 that sacrificed that wingtip rail they're different than than these underwing rails. Now you can get these in a Hasegawa weapon set or an F-16 kit, but these ones on the wingtips have navigation lights built into them. So they were important to grab these ones from the wings of the F-16 to put them on to the wings of the F-29 so we would have those nav lights um, as opposed to just cutting them off something like the underwing stations of the F-16. Um, so uh, basically a lot of a lot of this is other I have a sacrificial f-16 in 172 that I take a lot of parts from um, That I have taken a lot of parts from for other Kit bashing and, and what if projects like our ALR 69 Radar warning receivers up front had to add them um, one of the things that I really enjoyed doing was um, adding a gun muzzle to it and that was basically just sort of drilling diagonally, taking a length of plastic uh, tube and sort of, you know, just filing a, a groove, putting it in and then, and then molded with putty around it until we had something that was flush with the aircraft, but then came to a little bit, it, it, it's hard to see, it bulges out just a little bit, sort of like an F-14 was, was my inspiration for it. But we actually have a gun muzzle for, say, an M61 Vulcan cannon in there, because we will never not arm a fighter with a gun again after the fiasco with the F4 Phantom. On the top of the vertical stabilizer, we've got some more ECM gear. Uh, if you know what's in the tail of the F15, great. If you don't, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's open to discussion. To be honest with you, I, I just I don't know. We talked about it uh, when I was doing missions with the 433rd at Nellis. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's open source or not, but there's I, that comes from a Strike Eagle. Um, well, I got the idea from the uh, the Eagle, the Strike Eagle, and that's actually a uh, I think that's a Sparrow body that I used. And then I'm not sure where this piece is, but <laughs> I, I trimmed a little bit out of the base of the tail and put a piece on there, and that not only gives us more ECM, um, but also another nav light in the back. We've got a nav light in the back of there too. Under the wings here, these are the pylons from Hasegawa's 172 scale F-20. I'm working on a project with an F-20 that doesn't need any underwing armament at all, so it was just a natural donation. The F-20 really being an outgrowth of the F-5, I figured why not? That would kind of, that would kind of work. And there's some natural points on these wings where you can place these pylons they're just sort of the the shape of them just fits really well because you've got to make sure you clear these flaps and to use f16 hard points they're they're longer the the attachment points are longer than the ones for the f5 which you can see are pretty short there um, so they worked out really well also so I just used some like nat natural landmarking on the wings to make sure that I got them some panel lines or, or some uh, 
other landmarking on the kit. Oh my god, I forgot to take off a piece of tape. I had one little piece of masking tape stuck there that I didn't realize until right now in the video. That's embarrassing, but okay. Um, but so the, you know, there's, I just, I always use when I'm doing, when I'm making up new hardpoints, some kind of um, panel line or landmarking, some kind of physical thing on the kit to make sure I can always get them exactly centered. This uh, center line tank also comes from the F20. And one of the big considerations when putting a, anything center line on the X29 kit is that you have these large landing gear doors that come down. And this just so happened to be perfect, a perfect fit um, before being basically uh, a nuisance, a problem getting these landing gear doors. Now I did consider flipping them and having them open F-16 style on the other side of the wheels. So I, you know, I, I was looking for something that would match kind of um, sort of, uh, you know, a, a hard point loadout that was close to the F-16 because I was thinking this, the X-29, if it did, come down to actually um, fielding an F-29, it would be a lightweight fighter. It's small, just like the F-5. And what role would it fill? And it would definitely fill a lightweight fighter role. I mean, a, a pretty maneuverable. Uh, it didn't have the hyper maneuverability that they were looking for, like something with thrust vectoring would today, but definitely a, a highly maneuverable dog fighting lightweight fighter, like the F-16. The F-16 was intended to be a lightweight, daytime only, very maneuverable dogfighter. And then the Good Idea Fairy showed up during design and, and production, and it ended up doing the jack-of-all-trades role it does today. The decals all came out of that same Hasegawa 172 scale F-16A kit. Um, and I used them because, number one, they were right there readily available. And I was doing kind of an economical build here. And they fit because size-wise, and not so much shape-wise, but a little bit shape-wise, they just transferred really well from one kit to another. It, you know, considering the time frame that I was, I was building this what if in, um, the F-16 was around from, it entered service in 1978. The F-16C hit the scene around 1988, but as late as the early 90s, some units were still flying the A model. It, it took a little transition. Um, they were flying the A plus, in fact, a little bit of an upgrade. Um, so it's you know it it's foreseeable that late eighties, even up to about nineteen ninety, um, not all U.S. Air Force squadrons were transitioned to the C model. And I'm not talking about Air National Guard or Reserve. I'm talking about Air, U.S. Air Force squadrons. Not even all of them were transitioned by the time Operation Desert Storm came around. Um, so putting the the actual F-16A unit markings on this works really well. Now, the 8th Fighter Wing uh, happens to be a unit based in Korea, and they are constantly on guard because, you know, if you, if you know this situation over there, technically the Korean War never ended. There is a ceasefire. There is not an armistice. There was not an end to that war. We just agreed to stop shooting at each other. But a state of war technically exists, and there is always high tension over there, and they are always running drills. I mean, we do, we do exercises and we do practice sorties and and stuff in in Europe and uh, in other parts of the Pacific and here in uh, the Conus region. But in Korea, they do honest to God. Things could jump off at any moment. And they have been known to fly their um, their familiarization flights are around the peninsula and just patrols with live armament all the time. Um, it's very uncommon for somebody in my career field to have not spent at least one or two tours in Korea. I, I don't know how I how I managed to get out of that. I've got friends that have been to Korea four or five times um, doing the tactical air control thing up there, uh, but. Yeah, it's it's like it's like a standard thing for us to have been over there um, on the ground, just ready to direct hate and call in thunder and, and everything else up in Korea. Um, so, you know, a factor with the armament that I put on here, you'll notice they're all live war shots, a live load, um, no practice shots. So, I you know, I was kind of a mixed bag, wondering should I should I do 
you know, training sortie up in Korea, but there are plenty of times where, where aircraft are fully equipped on alert with live loads and fly with live live warheads and everything, so I decided to go with it. Armament load, again, thinking the time frame. So we've got AIM 9Ms. We've got no guided weapons. All right, this is, again, most of Desert Storm was fought with just iron dumb bombs. I mean, that Desert Storm was when precision guided weapons really came into their own. And after Desert Storm was when we said, we need to start thinking about using these precision guided munitions as a mainstream. And it was Operation Allied Force where we saw more precision guided munitions than not used. And it was a transition there. But so for time period, this is this is really correct. Just dumb bombs. So uh, just like an F-16 might be loaded out in that time frame, because F-16s didn't have any kind of medium range weapons air to air wise until after Desert Storm. Um, we've got four Sidewinders, AIM-9Ms, and these are from the Hasegawa weapon set, complete with decals. I had to paint the, the bands on my own because the decals kept falling apart, but I managed to make the other markings work. Um, so all the all the bands, yellow bands and brown bands, are painted, you know, by hand. I had a lot of trouble with the uh, mounting the bombs on the triple ejector racks. They're probably not even in many places, and I'm ashamed and embarrassed. But I just between seeing and my big fat fingers, I ha I don't work in 172 very often, so I had a lot of trouble mounting weapons. And if they're a little off, I apologize. I did my very best. I really did. Um, but we've got six by Mark 82s, which would be, you know, a, a kind of a a standard war load for an F-16. In Desert Storm, we saw them, you know, finally in combat, we saw them hauling uh, up to four Mark 84 2,000 pounders. But they did a lot of their work, medium altitude, um, dumping 500 pound bombs to um, find close air support. So I'm flying a little lower with the 500 pounders. Now these cluster munitions, some people might be curious. I know they they look a little bit. At first, I was in I was looking in the kit because they came in the F-16 kit, and I've seen them in the F-16 kit over and over, wondering exactly what they are. They look a little bit like Mark 20s. They don't exactly look like CBU 87s, but I wanted to use them because they come in the F-16 kit, and they always have. And I finally, I, you know, I, I kept looking through all the inventory of U.S. cluster munitions to figure out what the hell they are. Well, they're not U.S. cluster munitions. They're British. They're BL-755s. And why they come with the Hasegawa 172 F-16 kit is beyond me. I, I just, I, I can't figure it out. But I was able to find one picture one picture of one Dutch F-16 carrying BL-755s, which are retired, by the way, now. Uh, the British used them heavily in the Falklands War, dropped off of Harriers. They are, uh, um, they are an anti-armor, anti-tank style cluster bomb. Um, those are their sub-munitions. Um, they are capable, they were capable of being dropped by other aircraft, specifically tornadoes and everything. They didn't use them in Desert Storm. They used them a little bit in Iraqi Freedom. The problem is these things do not do very well when dropped from medium altitude, which is, at the time, that was kind of the comfort zone of, of most tactical aircraft in a heavy air defense environment. Um, they were designed to work at low altitude when the thought was running into uh, Eastern Europe, we go low altitude below radar, and you know, it, it turned out to be a little bit different in, in, in Iraq. But if, in the Falklands, that's what the British Harriers did. The Sea Harriers went in low altitude, cl close air support, dropping it on Argentine forces. They used it heavily in an anti-infantry role, but you know, so I figured I'm gonna use them. I'm gonna use the 755s, because when else am I ever gonna use these bombs that I have just been throwing away uh, in 172 scale F-16 kits? You know, I, I've had probably three of them before, um, not because I wanted them, but other people wanted me to build them, and they've always been all air-to-air -air kits. So I've never had to fiddle around with these bombs before on them, but um, I just took some, uh, markings from 
the actual CBU-87s in the Hasegawa kit and just, just cut them up and marked them on there because there were no actual markings for them, but who cares, you know, they're on there. So I figured this would be a, a nice tactical air-to-ground loadout for a future, you know, for a, well, a past, I guess we'll say, Korea scenario. Take out a column of tanks on the way to somewhere and then you've got six Mark 82s to drop wherever. For the actual paint job, this is all Vallejo acrylic, various grays and shades of gray. Um, I, I went with, because somebody suggested it, the three color F-16 scheme, which did work out well. I believe it's light ghost gray on the bottom. It's definitely gunship gray for the upper. And I used something a little non-standard for the forward fuselage, and it escapes me right now. We've got some panels that are lightened and some that are darkened. White primer with black pre-shading and then some various dark gray panel washes. No black panel washes because we didn't want it to be like toy-like, but we wanted lots of, of staining and shading around panels. And uh, planes get very dirty in Korea because they're used a lot constant presence there um, and i had to cut these little guys the third control sir these are actually control surfaces on the on the x29 so they just are molded in um, so i cut them so i could display them actuated so as this guy is sitting on the ground with the canards this would actually be not only is this like the lack of hydraulic power sitting on the ground, but this would be if the pilot were pushing the stick forward. That's uh, what they would be positioned as. Cockpit, there's not a lot to show for it. So I decided to use a Quinta 3D set in the cockpit for an F5E because it works. Now I left the seat unglued so that if we chose, boy, I hope this works. We could wiggle the seat out and we could take a look if the camera chooses to focus on that. So I wanted a little bit of detail in the cockpit. Not that you're going to see much of it. But at least we've got that in there. Because the Quinta sets are just fantastic. The seat, again, is, uh, you know, just basic detail only. So I, I'm, you know, made some straps out of, uh, out of tape and just put it in so that there's something so that there's something there it's a very basic seat i do i do like the way that hasagawa did the canopy so you can you can have the canopy open or closed on the kit you just those actuators are either connected or not um if you i mean to display it properly you have to do a lot of surgery to have those actuators in there and close or or you could just do what the kit says and not glue those onto the back of the seat and just close the canopy i, I like the way it looks that way uh, there's a ladder included in the kit, and they basically, I, I had to do some surgery, so I took another ladder from another kit and glued, see this hook that fits over? So I glued it, the back end, I glued, so I glued two ladders back to back so I can make the actual hook that would sit inside the canopy railing so that it hooks on because otherwise I had to glue it on and I didn't want to glue it on. Maybe I wanted the ladder displayed and maybe I didn't. But this way we have the option. We could put the ladder on there to display it like on the ground ready. Or if I don't want to, I can just take it off. But otherwise, because there's no, there's no hook on this ladder, it just sort of ends right there. It just, it sits and it doesn't stay. But now... Because the real life ladder would have a hook that would hook it on. Now we have a hookable ladder so we can display it with that or not. So it's a fun project. Um, it's a great kit. It, I mean, you know, for its time and its size. If you it, And it's inexpensive. It's less than $20 on Amazon. Um, it, it's a really fun kit. The only markings it comes with is for the, obviously, for the experimental, you know, test, which isn't much. But you can do a lot with this kit. You can, uh, you can make it out to be a lot of things. I have a second one right now that is in the works. 
that is going to be all black. See, this is part part of the nose I was telling you about with the pedo tube and the strikes and everything. And this is cut down. Um, but this one is going to be... Guess. Oh, it's a little dusty. Guess what this one is going to be. Guess. So I, I really recommend that you get, you know, get this kit and have fun with it. The, X, the X-29. And you can do a whole lot of fun stuff with it. This is... Um, this is not the first what if based on this X-29 kit that I've done. But I like this one a lot. This one's really fun. So I would love to know your opinions on it. What you think I did right. What you think I did wrong. What you would have liked to have seen. What you'd like to see in the future. How do you guys like this style of video? I think I've asked before. Do you like these kind of walk arounds of finished projects? Or do you prefer to see the work in progress as it goes? Let me know. But as always, for everybody building your own out in YouTube land, keep building them, build them well, and I will see you guys with the next project, which will be a full build, right back here on the channel real soon.